The opening sequence of episode 42 is another case of what is effectively recap working to reframe how we view all the events thus far. With this episode being the big climax of the royal government arc, we flip through all the main players, with that intense pulsing beat accompanying all of it. We see the Flegel switcheroo, we see Budget Rogers' interrogation, we see Erwin being led into the light with the massive creaky doors revealing the False King. It'll be your choice to make. Yours and theirs. All of it just frames this episode as if time was running out. All sides are quickly mustering their forces and just trying to amass as much dirt on each other as they can. It is a race against time on absolutely all fronts. Eren is still going to be eaten, Historia is a huge question mark, and above all, we have Erwin who at this very moment is about to be executed and the scouts as a whole are to be dissolved. Which very nicely leads us into this episode's title, Reply. I think this one refers to Erwin's, the scouts' and generally the entire military's response to the coup. The thing with Season 3 is that while we might have been scheming the entire way through, thus far, the scouts have kind of been non-stop farming else. We lost Aaron and Astoria, the scouts are now public enemy number one, they've been framed for murders, top secret weapons are still being covered up, Erwin is on the brink of being killed, and generally, things are really really bad. So this right here is effectively their one final chance to do anything, so we finally punch back with our own reply. Alternatively, you could also take it to be Pixis's and or Zachary's reply. Both were initially kind of apprehensive about this coup, so their replies to the situation are crucial in actually pulling this whole thing off. We'll get to this a whole lot more in the episode itself, so hold that thought for now. And also, and yes, this is absolutely a coincidence, the number 42 is of course also the universal answer to the question of everything. So with the events of this episode and the truth about the corruption, the secrets of the council and everything else coming out, it also kinda sorta works out with this being episode number 42. Okay, no, that is just ridiculous. Let's just forget I said that. Moving into the episode itself, we open with a couple of dudes basically just setting the scene for everything to follow. They note how the entire military is gathering up for Erwin's judgments. Something we of course now know to have been a bit of a double-edged sword, as, you know, they are kinda used in the coup d'etat. Though in terms of setting up this episode, I think it just leans into that angle of us racing against time, and Erwin being set up as this grand figurehead that the government wishes to tear down and break the scouts as a whole. Historically, gallows weren't just a form of capital punishment, but rather a stage symbol of political power and religious morals. Unlike everyone else they've silenced before, they wanted to make Erwin's death a spectacle so that everyone else falls in line. Just like we've been talking about for quite a few hours now, basically all of this arc revolves around spinning these narratives. So with Erwin now being made out to be the quote-unquote big bad, his hanging would just be the ultimate signal to anyone wanting to oppose them. On top of that, don't forget that even this is merely a contingency plan. They already have Eren and Historia. Theoretically, it's only a matter of time before they can just kind of control the citizens of the Walls outright with the Founding Titan. I think it's again just a case of showing us why the truth has managed to stay hidden for so long. Even with the Founding Titan basically in their back pocket at this point, they still go through this entire scheme, and yeah, they will still fail, but it's certainly not like they get reckless. On the flip side though, there's of course also the argument to be made that hanging Erwin would merely turn him into a martyr and just bolster their resistance further. Something I myself thought while watching the series for the first time by the way, considering that Erwin named his successor already. But considering that they still believe that they have a grasp on the military, I think them not really worrying about that kinda does make sense. As far as they're concerned, they control the information, therefore they control the narrative. And on top of that, they also control the military, which can just clean up any stains, if you will. What they don't know is that the scouts are carefully jabbing away at each and every one of those elements, and their reply would come very, very soon. Hey, I said the episode's title again. We then cut to Erwin talking to the king, with him saying that if humanity were to lose the scouts, it'd be like losing their spear. First off, yes, spears are just about the most ingenious weapon and tool humanity has ever created. I mean, we've used them for like 500,000 years. So yes, Erwin stating it here can just be a very simple statement of the Walls losing their weapon. However, it is also a very important symbol in the world of Attack on Titan. First off, Ymir, the original founding Titan, is brought down by a single spear. So if the scouts are analogous to a spear and Eren is basically Ymir, well, in a roundabout way, history does end up repeating itself. The proverbial spear eventually kills Eren. And of course, both Ymir and Eren were also attempting to protect royalty. Emir, well, she just kinda attempted to body block it. 
But Aaron did much of what he did to ensure that Astoria never becomes a titan shifter and lives a long life. And we of course also have Emir's actual story being twisted by Marley into the legendary hero Helos, or Helos, I don't know, who supposedly killed the devil of all things. So in a mythological sense, the spear is once again super important. I guess Hanji took that one personally, because, you know, thunder spears? Bro said hold up and decided to become Zeus. And of course, this is overanalyzing. I think you can also extend the shield and spear analogy to Eren's own demise. He and the rest of the soldiers charging at Zeke were the proverbial shield, while Levi is the lone spear bringing him down. Though Erwin then says, suppose at this very moment, wall rows were to be breached. This is him deliberately planting that fear and doubt in their minds, just like he did in the previous episode with Niall. And in just a few minutes, they'd of course exploit this to the absolute highest degree with the whole coup, simply because the council literally has no clue what's going on. I mean, picture yourself in their shoes. The guy who's fighting on the front lines just had a Titan and Aaron fighting on his side and just recently captured a whole nother Titan in Annie. Now he's sitting here, most definitely knows that he will be executed, and raises this hypothetical of the wall being breached. And suddenly, the wall is breached. I don't know about you, but my mind would go from, number one, um, that's pretty bad, to number two, wait, was that just a bold prediction or did you just somehow do that? But Erwin does not stop, he lays out an exact scenario of what would happen next, saying that humanity would just be pushed into Walsina exactly as we saw with the fall of Maria, only this time they just run out of food completely. They already called the population once with the supposed recapturing of Maria. This time, that's not really an option anymore. The thing with this conversation is that everyone in the room knows that Erwin is right, but the council can't exactly just shut him up if they are to keep up this narrative of them being wholly fair and Erwin being the bad guy. We already saw them handing out extra rations just to keep the public on their side. Things right now are more than a little bit dicey as is. And again, as much as the council do already have Aaron and Astoria, it's not like they can immediately just go scorched earth either. And so all of this is Erwin just very cheekily bringing that fear to the surface, not just for the council, but for everyone in the room, before striking right at it. I think shots like this summarize that idea very, very well. He's bruised, his clothes are disheveled, he looks just plain horrible, and each and every person is looking right at him. Against everyone else in their clean uniforms, the episode frames him as if he is the only one who's seen and survived those horrors. It's almost as if he's crawled over here just to try to tell them the truth. He also notes that it's entirely possible that it won't even be Titans who breach Cena, but rather civilians. Much like with everything in Season 3 thus far, it just continues to reframe the quote-unquote enemy to emphasize that it was always people, and more specifically, people fighting out of fear. Fritz's wars were just out of fear of scarcity of resources. Emir turning into a Titan and becoming his war machine was out of fear of what might happen to her otherwise. Marley using the warriors was out of fear of technology catching up and of course the Paradisian Titans. And eventually, even the rumbling is just a fear of retribution. No matter how you swing it, the enemy was always human and mostly fear. Erwin then proposes said proverbial spear, saying Maria must be recaptured, which again carries the double meaning of us having to face the big monkey in Shiganshina. Though he also pokes the bear a little bit, asking whether they might just have some other secret plan to overcome this hurdle. We of course know that they actually do, but in this episode's narrative, I think it's more so just Erwin pushing that message of these guys don't exactly have your best interest in mind and they really don't know what they're even doing. And what I absolutely love here is the sound design. The entire sequence is accompanied by that tense beat, with those occasional uneasy and fearful strings just cutting right through. And then we cut to that silence as the confrontation happens, it's just beautiful. Cowering in wait behind these walls will solve nothing. Unless you have some sort of secret plan by which we might overcome this ordeal. But the council then fires back saying that everything he says is irrelevant and citing the Charter of Humanity and how one shouldn't prioritize self-gain over humanity. First off, yes, that is like mega hypocritical, no. especially with them citing Aaron's Titan as their ultimate what? argument while they themselves aim to use it to gain absolute control over the walls. But number two, and this is something Aaron himself would bring up at the tail end of this episode, self-gain is kind of what drives everything and everyone, including Erwin. Because of his childhood and his father being silenced, 
He never really tells anyone his plans. The scouts as a whole don't share their findings and generally everything they do is kept close to the chest. Don't forget that the sheer existence of Titan Shifters as a concept was only ever formally declassified at the end of Season 2. So for many living within the walls, it can genuinely seem like Erwin is using their one and only weapon not to improve the current state of living, but to rather shoot for some pie-in-the-sky dream beyond the walls that only seems to result in constant and guaranteed death. It's very hard for them to think about some fantastical freedom and some magical greater war when they're literally starving, right? When food is an issue, truth and some bigger picture simply doesn't matter. Even for us watching the series, it is hard to deny that much of what drives Erwin is his father's dream. Remember that scene in the season 2 finale? Upon learning that the Titans are just people, he suddenly smiled, managing to stun even Levi. Like we've talked about before, yes, that was in part because the enemy is now a quantifiable force. But I think equally, or perhaps even more so, it was a purely selfish pursuit of finally confirming his father's beliefs. That's of course not to say that Erwin is entirely selfish or as bad as the Council or whatever. No, far from it. But just that in every single selfless action, you can always find some degree of selfishness. Not because of some malice, but simply because that's what people are like. Self-preservation is part encoded to us. It's just that for many, that selfish ambition also propels humanity as a whole forward in some really, really good ways. Think of like people doing charity work. You will often hear people say, oh, you're only doing it for PR, oh, you're only doing it for tax benefits, or better yet, maybe they're doing it just because their brain literally gives them a reward signal for helping others. But it's still a net positive on the world, even if underneath there is a degree of selfishness or, well, just brain chemistry. But even so, it doesn't really matter, right? Good has been done and the big picture of Yuil is still selfless. And the same goes for Erwin here. His father's dying wish might be what drives him internally, but around that core dream, there is a deep desire to free humanity as a whole and to learn of what or who truly imprisoned them. But one thing I love here is just how the perspective keeps shifting, with us now going from Erwin to the Council and finally, Nile. Note how when we cut to him, we see a first-person view standing behind Erwin. Firstly, very blatantly showing us that we are now in Niall's mind and his internal monologue would color much of what we'll be seeing. But number two, and yes, this is definitely a wee bit of overanalyzing, also showing us that he now stands behind Erwin in support. It's not just an upward-facing shot zooming in on Niall or anything. It deliberately puts his view behind Erwin and we see it through his eyes. But okay, returning to more sensible matters. Number three, I think it also does a really, really good job of just capturing that anxiety of the situation. Suddenly, Erwin and the Council become this background noise that you can't tune out. You also slew Demo Reeves when he learned too much. With each and every single thing they say, Nile just grows more and more uneasy. Erwin talking about the walls falling, suddenly those questions about his family become these almost eerie forewarning statements. Made even greater when the Council says Erwin killed Demo, something he knows almost 100% did not happen. He is between a rock and a hard place. Erwin is as cryptic as ever, and much of what he says is starting to sound like a roundabout threat. But the Council… oh, the Council has been silencing anyone who opposes them for a very, very long time. So yet again, the show has put us in the same headspace of a perspective character as we too, just like Niall, just try to find a way out of the situation. But okay, let's all catch a breath real quick. Because something I haven't brought up yet and is absolutely not relevant to anything whatsoever is the names of the Council members. All of them are very much on the nose, so I'll just really quickly rush through them so we can check off that trivia box. Gerald, the military representative, means rule of spear or bright spear in Germanic, so, you know, very military. Aureal or Oriel, I have no idea, one of the high-ranking nobles, is likely derived from Aurum, I think that's how you say it, meaning golden Latin, or even the feminine name of Aureal, I guess, meaning golden. See if you can tell how many cuts there are in between these bits, I literally have no idea how you say any of these names. I'm mixing together like five different languages, oh my god, help me. But yes, a noble, gold, rich, makes sense. Roderick, the representative of the church, may be chosen to represent fame, glory, and rule. Which, considering the wall religion and how much sway it has, I think fits. And Deltoff? Well, Deltoff actually doesn't have much of a meaning as far as I gather, but no one really cares about him, so it's fine. And there's a whole bunch of meaning behind the Fritz name, but we'll leave all of that for the actual Fritz story as there's a bunch of over-analysis to be done there. But returning to that point of framing, 
Once we get the back and forth between the council and Erwin, I think the show also very deliberately has these almost two profile shots of the opposing sides. We have the council on the right, and we have Erwin and Pixis on the left. Not sure if it's intentional, but the almost face-to-face -face standoff shots definitely seem deliberate. Though Pixis then joins the conversation, repeating much of what he already said in Trust. Humanity is on the brink as is, but then saying, even so, I have nothing to do with the scouts. Adding that if they pose a threat to humanity and wish to throw it into another bloodbath like Trost, the scouts should just be dismantled. This is something that I feel like has actually been really underappreciated in AOT, because I think many of us immediately assume that, yeah, yeah, sure, we already saw them talk and both agreed to go against the government, and we also saw almost this exact scenario play out with Aaron's tribunal. And big surprise, that is exactly what happens, which is why I think many tend to overlook the fact that Pixis is not in fact loyal to Erwin. It's kind of like a reverse twist, in that it both confirms the obvious theory that they're working together, while also sort of disproving itself to an extent. With Pixis later saying that his allegiance is 100% dependent on what actually happened here. We just talked about those underlying selfish desires, right? Well, I'll go out on a limb and say that Pixis is as close to disproving that statement as I think we really get in the series. Perhaps it's a byproduct of age and him having seen countless of these young feisty soldiers wanting to change the world just charge right into their deaths. But Pixis doesn't seem motivated by some single goal aside from just genuinely helping humanity. He doesn't side with Erwin immediately for all the reasons we've talked about already. Erwin does good, but it often comes at a tremendous cost. If the Council, even with their evil deeds, can make sure that humanity survives and some even thrives, well maybe they are the better option. Remember the people of Stoas, they didn't sign up for Erwin's mission. With just how much we tend to idealize Erwin, I think Pixis offers this really interesting and kind of emotionally detached role to really make us do some cost-benefit analysis ourselves. Could it be that we want to side with Eren just because we like him? Just because we follow him? Or is it because he actually benefits humanity? Sounds like an awfully similar set of questions we would soon start asking with Eren, huh? Almost as if the entire story was about not getting lost in the sauce and not perpetuating these cycles of death, huh? Though with Erwin's judgement set, that intense, pulsing drum descends into this poor like cacophony with Nile just blurting out, Wait, what about your dream? But yet again, we just see Erwin smile. Walrose has fallen! The gates have been breached! And suddenly, that intense music is replaced by the now very familiar female titan theme that has this tactical and almost scheming vibe to it. What about your dream? This is it. Erwin's next big scheme is now in motion, and the episode immediately tells us that with the music. Like, remember that this is supposedly the fall of Rose, a nigh cataclysmic event akin to the series premiere. But the music isn't the Colossal's theme or some huge climactic battle. No, it's a cold and meticulous plan. Just like with the female Titan mission where Erwin knew, well, almost, exactly what they were doing and eventually lured out Annie. And the way all of this unfolds is another perfectly orchestrated sequence from both an in-universe sense as well as a purely story one. The Council is shook to their absolute core by the sudden intrusion. There are likely being dozens of thoughts racing through their minds with everything from Eren's capture to all of this may well being Erwin's doing. But before they can say a word, Pixis immediately establishes himself as the authority in the situation. Without skipping a beat, he immediately starts screaming out orders to plan himself on the side of the walls, and to demonstrate that he is far more level-headed than any of the Council. Just like with the rest of the season thus far, it is all about narratives. To dumb it down to the absolute bare bones, Erwin is the bad guy. So if Pixis associates with the bad guy, well, he must be a bad guy. To combat this, he establishes himself as the undisputable good guy, also showing that he is actually an even better guy than the Council because he immediately steps up. The thing with our little monkey brains is that we are very hard to convince and some of us even get extremely defensive over opinions we know ourselves to be wrong. So if everyone in the room tells themselves that, yes, Pixis is indeed the good guy, and then Pixis tells them that, listen, Erwin is actually the good guy after all, 
Well, chances are, they would have already convinced themselves once, and they're probably not going to suddenly turn on Pixis. But perhaps even more importantly, aside from Pixis, Erwin has already singled out what might just be the single most important MP to play the part of the middleman. That, of course, again being Niall. He was the one confronting Erwin during the Tribunal. He was the one confronting Erwin in Stoas. He is also the one talking to reporters. So if he now were to plant himself on the side of Pixis and, by extension, Erwin, he too signals to everyone that they are, in fact, on the quote-unquote right side. And that is, of course, immediately proven by Oriel or Aureel, again, I don't know, yelling to shut the gates at once. Had he done it, like, literally 30 seconds sooner, there is a good chance things might have gone his way and the MPs would have complied simply because that's just what they do. But now that both Erwin with his warnings and Pixis with his commands have gotten their foot in the door, they quickly realize that they are effectively killing all of Walros. And again, most of all, we have Niall as that crucial personal link with his family residing in Walros. He is that bridge between these major players and the rest of the MP. But in classic AOT fashion, the show once again sows doubts just moments before the whole thing crescendos. With the Council now confidently talking about how they already have Aaron, Something that, if true, would indeed give them absolute control. Though with his family now being in the first line of defense, Niall is the first one to crack. With him again bridging the gap between the rest of the MP and Erwin's thought process. But before they can get up in arms about it, Zachary walks in, plainly announcing that all of this was in fact an act. With Pixis then delivering his S-tier monologue that we already talked about a second ago about how he wasn't originally aligned with anyone. So at this point, in this room, we have the narrative covered like 100%. And the super loyal MPs are all gone rounding up scouts. So on top of that narrative, we have the manpower as well, which basically puts the final nail in the coffin. We talked about Pixis plenty, but I think Zachary's role too ties back to what we saw with Aaron's Tribunal. As much as his actual power might be debatable on the crown level, he does ultimately function as an arbiter within the military branches. So again, him being here just signals absolute strength. So with the MP's perspectives now flipped and the military to back us, all that's left is the public opinion, right? This is still a coup d'etat after all. And on that note, we jump on over to Fleegoop, who has convinced the papers to also print his side of the story with the promise that the military is actually backing them. So effectively, we've dismantled the government from the very, very top by showing their true colors. And now we're dismantling the public narrative through already trusted channels, so all of this is going down in one fell swoop. Also, this shot of the scouts reacting to their names being cleared is just pure insanity and I love it. Levi just standing there without ever flinching, Connie doing a certified black belt third don kick, Sasha just straight up trying to rip Mikasa's head off, it's just the best kind of whimsical shenanigans. But what I find particularly interesting is how Hanji brings up that this wasn't just Erwin's gamble. This was many people putting their necks on the line to pull this off. It's those individual choices coming together to change the world. Something that I think is at the very, very heart of Attack on Titan. Once again, shamelessly reused meme, but we've talked about many, many times about how those reductive statements of quote-unquote the enemy and whatnot is exactly what fuels these never-ending cycles of hatred. A series like Attack on Titan does unfortunately have the tendency to bring out some, let's call them unhinged opinions. So I think Hanji's statements like this just underlines that message of behind all of these big bad nations stand individual people making individual choices. Even in this overanalyzing series, I always just say Marley or Parody for the sake of simplicity. But in reality, we are talking about tiny, tiny sections of those nations. Statements like Marley is in the wrong or Parody is in the wrong imply that those hundreds of thousands of civilians supported whatever it was that was going on. Something this entire arc aims to disprove. By leaning into these arguments of this side and the other side, you fall for the trap that it is setting. The goal of these things is to homogenize the other side, dehumanize it, and make yours seem far more appealing. The public opinion is absolutely a core instrument to maintaining power, that much is true. But we also just saw how malleable it is, and in some cases, actually doesn't matter at all if there is an opposing force at play. Erwin's father wanted to disprove the government, but it did not matter because he was forcefully silenced. Though from an outsider's perspective, you'd think that he was never even opposing them, right? I mean, nothing changed. And the same holds true in the opposite direction. Achievements often attributed to entire groups of people may rather be attributable to a select few or sometimes even just one. 
again, because of our monkey days when all we had to do is focus on that one bad monkey trying to yoink our food, we are just not really used to thinking about things big picture-wise. Large groups of people do just become a single mass, and we often tend to notice only the few, very, very loud people. I mean, just look at Twitter, you'd think that the entire world had lost their minds. So both in good and bad, I think the series does a really good job of reminding us that these opinions, these narratives, and these forces are not just these abstract, ambiguous masses. At the end of the day, these are all individuals. Ones absolutely affected by their environments, but still making individual choices. But okay, all big picture moral quandaries aside, Levi then basically just says, yeah, this is all fine and dandy, but we still don't know what's going on with Aaron and Storia. Which nicely leads us into the mid-card describing the Crystal Catacombs. First off, it just spells out exactly how the Titan powers are transferred, just in case anyone still had any doubts. But in practical terms, I think it just re-establishes that rush against time, with it again telling us that Aaron is going to be eaten. Secondly, it once again opens up the bizarre conundrum that is the Titan Hardening, which, don't forget, started all the way back in Season 1 with Annie, and later the plan to plug up Maria. I know it's a very, very odd thing to say, but don't forget that the original story of Season 2 was for Aaron to plug up the wall. What derailed that was, well, let's call them unwanted visitors. And lastly, it establishes a little bit of information asymmetry. As we are explicitly told that underneath the church that we're about to see is a weird titan magic thingy, while the characters in-universe are still completely unaware of this. Hold that thought for now. Before we get to Eren though, we just see a bit of a follow-up with the public, many of whom are still understandably in shock. I mean, why would they suddenly just trust them, right? I think it again just illustrates that difficulty in molding these narratives that we've been talking about a lot. Though what I find most interesting is the little bit of reflection Erwin does here. With him saying, perhaps it was better to just let the council be. They did know a lot after all. Then adding the very, very spooky line of, maybe letting half the population die is better than all of it going extinct. Which loops right back to that eternal trolley problem Erwin is facing. The scouts basically signed their lives away as is. But the thing is, we don't know how many of those sacrifices there will be. We don't know what other twists the mission might take. Just like we saw in Stoas, many civilians ended up getting caught in the crossfire instead. So eventually, we don't even know what that trolley problem might look like. It originated as a decision between the scouts and the rest of humanity. Something that is very, very easy, right? But the more we explore the situation within the walls and beyond the walls, the more complex it becomes. Zachary echoes a similar belief, stating that, yeah, maybe death would have been easier for you. But he then says that, deep down, he probably valued his own life more than humanity. Not because he doesn't value humanity, but because he believes he has to be there to see it. Which, yes, again loads back to that self-preservation argument we talked about earlier. Erwin is a very good dude, literally willing to tear himself apart in humanity's name. But underneath that, there is a selfish desire to prove his father right and just fundamental self-preservation. I keep repeating this because a lot of the time when I say someone is selfish, people think it's like an negative connotation. No, it's just that you care about yourself. In many ways, that is very, very good. In Erwin's case, he is literally clinging on to life with everything he has. That is very good. We then cut on over to Levi's squad where Hanji talks about the book Erwin gave to them a few episodes prior. This is basically just Hanji connecting all the dots we've talked about before. There was a certain incident five years ago, coincidentally exactly when Maria fell, exactly when Grisha poofed out of existence, exactly when Eren was given the key, and exactly when Rice showed up for Historia. Hanji also immediately notes that the whole bandit story doesn't even make much sense considering the chapel was destroyed, likely pointing to some sort of titan connection. In reality, we know that Grisha killed everyone except Rod and busted up the entire building. And Hanji also notes that, right away, Rod built a whole new chapel on top. Which takes us back to that Midgard we just saw. The reason why he built a new one on top is because there is something far more important underneath. Also, in terms of good old Chekhov's guns, note how Hanji says that he had five kids, but literally the only one that is ever lingered on is the eldest Frida. Very, very blatantly telling us that she is the only one we need to worry about, mostly because, well, she held the founding time and she cared for Historia. Levi throws another very sus statement, asking whether a story's importance might have something to do with her bloodline. Oh, Levi, isn't that a very specific guess? I mean, yes, this basically confirms that the royal blood is the important bit. It's just way too important to be just a, hey, could it be this? The interesting bit is how it loops back to that awakening of the coordinates and why all of that happened in the first place. 
As of right now though, they of course don't quite connect those dots. Practically speaking, this is just reminding us of where we stand and laying out all the puzzle pieces that we'd now be piecing together to just understand that crucial why. And speaking of why, we then get a casual scene of Eren seeing Frida's memories or Frida seeing Eren's memories or Frida seeing Eren or Eren seeing Frida or I guess actually everything at the same time. But the transition between Eren sleeping, Frida brushing her hair but then being suddenly startled and then Eren waking up is of course establishing a deliberate link between the two and already showing us some memory shenanigans. As we've talked about before, with the Attack Titan, future inheritors can choose to send their memories to past holders. Well, with the Founding Titan, and especially once Eren enters the paths, the flow of time itself just fundamentally doesn't matter. From strictly Eren's perspective, it is a closed loop with memories of every holder just bleeding together as we see here. But okay, before we get to big analysis time, I don't think I will ever forget seeing the Crystal Chapel catacombs thingy for the first time. Which by the way, yes, Founding Titans got my head all mixed up. Just writing the script now, I realized I've been calling them the Crystal Catacombs for like 20 videos, even though that is literally a place in Avatar, and this is never actually called the Crystal Catacombs. I think I'm dumb and just connected Grisha Slaughter to this and just named it Catacombs as well. But okay, let's do this. All of you are in the paths with me right now. So what we're gonna do now is I'm just going to keep calling them the Crystal Catacombs and never mention it again. We're just gonna act as if that was always the name and anyone saying that it hasn't is wrong, okay? We're just gonna go with that. Seeing this place for the first time was just so surreal. We went from these plains and forests and realistic European architecture to the most abstract, weirdly magical place imaginable. One that was directly preceded with some very spooky memory shenanigans. Oh, how I wish I could re-experience this for the first time again. Someone take me back. Also, we've talked about the imagery of Eren's enslavement before with things like the Season 1 AD. But this, and the rest of Season 3, is where that really kicks into overdrive. We'll be talking about all of these individually, so for now, I'll just flash up some of the most obvious imagery all portraying Eren as the strung of puppets. All of them have shown us, and will just continue to show, that his drive for freedom is nothing but an illusion. Plenty more on that soon. And the final shots of this episode is Armin very explicitly reminding us of the still unsolved quandary that is Eren's Titan. If we now know how Titan powers are inherited, well, who did Eren eat and when did that happen? Again, I do think we have plenty of evidence pointing to the fact that it was in fact Grisha. But of course nothing is totally confirmed as of yet. Actually, I guess this is an interesting question to leave things on. Were you in the camp of Grisha turning Eren into a Titan but escaping to somewhere himself? Or did you always assume that Eren did in fact eat his papa? Do let me know. That said, that is episode 42. Finally, all the politics, schemes, and all those sorts of shenanigans are behind us. So now, it's full steam ahead to the Crystal Catacombs and eventually, the marvel that is returned to Shiganshina. Also, another reminder, once again, in this episode we get a single glimpse of Eren, the so-called protagonist, and the rest of the episode is literally just dudes talking. Which again, I think just shows how strong the rest of the cast was. Characters like Erwin, Pixis, even Nile can carry an entire episode just fine. But alright, all that said, it is time to get into weird Titan magic shenanigans. So, I hope to see you back next time as we continue overanalyzing Attack on Titan. And that's the video. The start of the year has been a little bit rough for me health-wise, so I hope the slightly longer wait wasn't too painful. If all goes well, I'm sure we'll be back to normal scheduling in no time. You have no idea how excited I am to get into the absolute craziness that is the latter half of Season 3. But anyway, with that, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons and YouTube members who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. And let's also give a warm welcome to the newest members of the team, Jake Manning and Brittany. Without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my ramblings, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye!